Okay, here we are at Susan May's pottery shop. Hey. Hi. Hi, Cheryl. Hey, how are you? Stepping <laughs> on. Let's yeah. get Mary Lou. Susan May is my favorite potter because I love her work. She is, she uses color a lot. She doesn't use them browns and ugly things, earthy tones. <laughs> I, I'm just not an earth tone person. And so she uses wonderful colors, pinks, blues, greens, and you'll see uh, she's going to give you a glaze demonstration. And Susan um, started out as a painter, and because she started as a painter, she didn't want to lose uh, the color a lot, like in clay, so she does a lot with uh, colors and everything. And uh, Susan graduated with an MA at the University of Tennessee Tech. She took glass classes, and uh, she started the studio how many years ago? My studio, well, this is the second location. The first location was 1986 or something like that. Because I was been at the craft center from 81 until, well, I guess 83 as a full-time student. And then I finished my master's a few years after that. But that still doesn't seem right. Lose track Anyways, of what can you say? I've been in this spot for almost 10 years. And she teaches uh, at Vanderbilt. She teaches uh, clay classes at Vanderbilt. And she has work um, all over the United States, don't you, Susan? Yeah, not too much west of Mississippi because stoneware is heavy and it costs a lot of money to ship it. So mostly it's like we do a lot of galleries in Tennessee because we hand deliver. But we do ship to um, George Watson Company in, in Milwaukee and the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. and Ray Blue in Atlanta. So yeah, we have a few out of state. And you'll see when you see her work, you'll be able to tell you see how distinctive her work is from other uh, pottery. And she'll tell you what she's doing now. Well, what kind of a workshop is this? Uh, watercolor. Watercolor. Oh, a little bit of oh, oil thing. Oil thing. Oil thing. Basket making. Okay, but no clay. No clay. No clay. Have, have very many of you ever seen this done? Yes. Yes, yeah. we just saw it done in Turkey. Oh. Uh, which was fascinating. Yeah, it's a pretty mesmerizing process. The first thing you got to do is uh, get the ball of clay centered. And I like to cone up and push down a lot because it helps wedge the clay, which means it gets the moisture content even throughout the clay. It works out the air bubbles and it gets those little platelets. That's microscopic. Structure clay lined up. So you start out with kind of a cupcake shape. You find sides, flatten top, and then you make your opening. Find the exact center and push. So now you have kind of a glazed donut shape. Gosh, you make it look easy. Then you make the opening wider by just pulling straight out. And then while it's open like this, it's a good idea to uh, compress the bottom to keep the clay from cracking. That pushes those little platelets together, makes them stronger. And smooth the finger ridges out of the bottom. And smooth up the top. And then I like to cone it back in because if you you got to get the walls to move up, and then you can form a shape from that. Even for open bowls, you still have the clay going in first, and then you can open it. Once you've opened the clay, it's real hard to get it back in. Uh, I don't usually have a shape in mind when I do these demonstrations, but if I did, I would be doing minor changes at this point with that shape in mind. But at this point, I'm just going to do an even walled cylinder, which is the basic, basic shape. And I'm going to compress the walls between my inside hand and my outside hand, taking care to smooth the top edge, sop up excess water so you don't get cracking in the bottom. And then I'm going to thin the walls further by pushing my inside hand, fingers out and then my outside fingers also push in. So that bulge you see my outside follow, my hand following is actually my inside fingers pushing against the inside wall, pushing out. And my outside hand sort of follows and exerts 
upward pressure against my inside hand. So that squeezes the clay, and your, most of your thickness is down here, so you want to even out the, the clay. And so you exert strong pressure at the base, and then as you go up the side, you gradually um, lighten up on the pressure. Otherwise, you'd end up with a piece where the top edge was paper thin, and this was still too thick. So you start out with strong pressure, and you gradually ease up, and sort of just glide through. You follow through with each pull so that your piece stays on center. Okay, so now that I've got even walls, I'm going to cut out some of the excess clay out of the bottom. It's hard to get your hands underneath the clay to push up here. And use your wa water to keep your hands from like sticking to the clay. So now I've got enough clay in here to make a little bit of a shape, but I didn't leave a lot of clay in there, so I can't really um, expand the shape too much. But this move is a little bit different. It's like stretching the clay to make it bulge. And so I'm really pushing hard with the inside hand. Make the shape bulge, and then I can refine the shape <coughs> using rib tools. And this also compresses the walls and makes them stronger. And I can also use yeah. these rib tools to create different contours. Now your demonstration pieces aren't as good as. Like if I was sitting down to work and I was concentrating on what I was doing. When you do demonstration pieces, they don't usually have the same elegance as when the, you're working by yourself and you can think about your shapes more. So mine's got a little bit of a wobble to it, but it's also the first one of the day. And Sometimes, like other skills, you need to get warmed up a little bit. So I'm not really warmed up yet. Excuses, excuses. Pardon me? <laughs> excuses, excuses, excuses. Well, okay, if you really want to know the truth, I don't really throw that much. I have a kind of a business, and I have several assistants working with me, and they're very talented at throwing, and they like that part. I like that part, too, but the part I really like is blazing, because that's where I bring in my painting and my, my love for color and surfaces. So I really don't throw every day, so I might be a little rusty. <laughs> so I thought I'd just go ahead and show you the part that I really enjoy and that I'm really good at, which is over on the other side of the studio. Yeah, we recycle. All these orange buckets here have recycled clay in them. And we let it dry out and we pulverize it, or if it's the trimmings from like, the bottom edge of this has to be trimmed. We recycle all that and we mix powdered clay back into this kind of sloppy consistency to bring it back to a working consistency. So not only do we recycle for us, but for our assistants and at, from the school that I teach at and another potter who doesn't have a uh, clay mixing area. So we do a lot of clay recycling, really. It's a way to, well, it might save money, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, over here is the glaze area. And I'm not using all of the glazes today. It's hard to know where to start with this glazing business. There's a, there's a very hot kiln over there, so that's why the vacuum cleaner is there to block you from that. When the kiln is at its hottest, it's at like 2,400 degrees inside that chamber. So if you even just touch the metal part, you probably burn yourself. Now I'm going to be wanting to like scoot around close to the table, so if you, I don't mind like scooting in front of you, but I don't want to push you over to get to my favorite glaze. Okay, so what is glaze? Well, basically it's glass, and it's it's melted to the surface of the clay. I like to leave the bottom raw clay because I really like the raw clay and in fact in some of my work I leave areas of raw clay just because it's a contrasting <laughs> texture. Um, so it's a skin of glass and it's been melted to the surface. Well in this form it's been mixed as a powder 
and it's got silica, which melts at 3,000 degrees. It's got a, a flux, which lowers the melting point of the um, silica. It has different ingredients that control whether it comes out sort of a satin matte or whether it comes out a high gloss. There's lots of different surfaces. I don't use very many dry, dry glazes. I have a gold that's kind of dry, but most of my glazes are satin mattes, semi-glosses, or high glosses. So that's, there's some ingredients that control the, the surface. And then the most important ingredient for me is the color. Cobalt carbonate makes blue, copper carbonate makes green, manganese dioxide can make either beiges or purples, and chrome tin mixtures can make burgundies or paints. So um, this is where the, my painting comes in. I like to work with a full palette of glazes. A lot of potters work with maybe six, maybe 10, but I work with like 30 to 50 different glazes because I want just that right shade of green. So I have like seven shades of green, maybe eight. I have um, at least a half dozen shades of blue and I have four browns, a white and a black and I have a couple of burgundies and a pink. And one of the things about glazing is you can't tell the color at this stage. This is a pur the purple glaze that's in the middle of that mug. Actually, it's more of a mauve, mauve being a light purple. Whereas this glaze here is this deeper purple. Yes. <laughs> this is one blue. This is another blue. And that's still another blue. So that's this light pastel blue here. And we call this one deep blue. We call this one mystery blue. We call that one mystery blue because we have another recycling program, which is our glaze ingredients. Every time I wipe my hands or wipe the bottom of a piece or squeeze out my sponge, there's glaze materials connected to it. And so it gets washed off in these Wa all these wash-off buckets, which are strategically placed, and then we let the ingredients settle to the bottom, drain the water off the top, and then they all the ingredients go into that big barrel behind that lady. And we have now three forms of mystery blaze. One of them is this blue, one of them is a green, and one of them is an, a deeper shade of blue, because Really, the glaze ingredients are more expensive than the clay. So if you just, well, you really shouldn't pour them down the sink anyway, because heavy metals are not good in drinking waters. So if you don't use your glaze ingredients, what are you going to do with them? You can pour them out the back door. You shouldn't wash them down the sink. So we found a way not only to get um, results that are easily reproduced, but also we sell some of our buckets of mystery glaze to some other potters. Okay, so I should tell you now, after I've um, told you about the colors and the surfaces, I should talk about how I get the glaze on there. There's lots of different ways. The least favorite of mine is brushing, because when you brush a whole surface, it's hard to get it on there evenly. It ends up looking splotchy or doesn't have a nice look to it. So mostly I dip and pour. So I'm going to show you my, a few dipping things. This series here is my dip, my melting bands of colors, what I call it. And the lines are dipped pretty straight, and I always hope that in the firing that at least a couple of the lines will be broken by the melting of the glaze so that I don't really like straight lines, but I do like a nice transition from one color to the next. And I'm always playing with new color combinations. So like last week, that was sort of my purple I was in a purple mood, so I did a bunch of pieces based on these two. And then the week before, I was in sort of a green mood, so I did a lot of pieces with green combinations. And I like some more than others, and sometimes I'll forget my favorite combinations and I'll have to rediscover them. And then another week, I might be into blue, so it changes a lot because, I don't know, artists are temperamental. <laughs> Different do, you moods. Bake, do you bake that pot? before you bake it? Right, I, I neglected to tell you that part of this process, which is after it's completely dried, it gets fired to this bisque temperature, which it, it's pink because of the red iron oxide and the clay, but it's also um, porous. See how the clay absorbs water? Well, yes. the glaze is suspended in water, 
So when you apply the glaze and the clay, it soaks into the surface. And then when you fire it the second time, that's when it melts. So thank you for pointing that out. Do you dip from one color to another? Um... Right, that's what I was going to show oh. you. Like, these two are basically the same color combination. I just wanted to show you them at different stages. I do the inside one day, and I guess I could do the inside of something here, like this cup here, just to show you how the inside is done. And I do the in inside one day because the clay is um, like a sponge. Imagine this is the wall. Well, if you glaze the inside, the water soaks into the interior. And so when you try to glaze the outside, it doesn't soak up enough glaze. So you get a really thin coating. Well, I like really potent color, and my glazes are need to be really thick to get to bring out that color. If your glazes are really thin, then you're not going to have strong color. So I glaze the inside one day, let it sit for a day so that the water evaporates off, and then I do the outside another day. So I had to do the inside of this one. Also, doesn't the the glaze make it uh, seal it better too? The better right. Glaze? It's just like it makes it vitreous is the word you're yeah, looking okay. for which means glass-like. So that's the inside. And this was a cracked mug that I intended to use for a test. Lots of times if I'm working on a new color, I'll um, use new glaze tests on cracked pieces because they're more accurate. You get a better idea of the glaze, the nature of the glaze, on a real piece rather than a little test tile. It dries so fast. Right. It's already soaked in quite a ways, uh -huh. but I still wouldn't glaze the outside yeah. today. So this one had the inside done mystery, and I dipped the lip, like I did that one. And then on this one, I did a second lip color. So this is the second lip color. It's burgundy. So I've dipped the top. It looks green to me. <laughs> it's the greenest looking burgundy. And now I'm going to dip the lip. And I, I know that what these two glazes do together. All right, so now I'm ready to work from the bottom. And this is the other shade of burgundy that I work with. How do you lay out your palette? Um, a lot of it's just based on previous experience. No, I meant your bucket palette of... Um, oh, there's no, there's no order. It's okay. totally random. <laughs> Nobody knows it but me. Oh, all right. In other words, I've been working with these glazes for so long that I don't have to have a label, and it doesn't have to be in a specific order. I just look at that bucket, and I know it's new green. I look at that bucket, and I say, that's my green. That's mystery. That's your secret recipe. <laughs> right, so, no, there's no, like, order to it. I, I guess the main thing is the most important glazes that I use all of the time are in these two tables, and then back here are glazes that I don't use as often. Like, I have special orders sometimes where they would want a very specific color. A lot of artists don't like to do special commissions, but I do because I want to be a student forever, and I view it as just another assignment. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to do commissions because it's an assignment, and that way I have to satisfy someone who's a consumer, but in a way I'm wanting to please them like I wanted to please my teachers or myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, but it's another learning experience as well. Right, that's true. And then sometimes from a special commission, I'll, I'll have a new idea that carries on into yeah. something that is Excellent. really about my work. Right. So I like special commissions because it forces me to think differently than I might be thinking on a daily basis. Oh, that one's still wet, so I don't want to dip that one. Some of the glazes take longer to dry. Sometimes I like to put um, an accent of color in the foot to like define the foot. Okay, so now you're wondering, well, how am I going to get those other bands of color on? Well, that's yeah. part of the trick of my work is wax resist. And I'm going to have to disappear around the corner and <laughs> Take <her> dip <laughs> this in wax. No, then you'll see the next color. Waxing isn't all that easy. Sometimes you make mistakes and you blow. So. Then I have to pretend I'm a, um, a dental hygienist and I'm scraping the tartar and <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, anyway, that gets it off the surface. Otherwise, I'll have this big bare spot where I blow. So waxing is not as easy as you think. You have to be careful about dripping. We wax the bottoms of the pieces 
because uh, again I like the raw clay showing but I also don't want to stilt everything when I fire it so by waxing the bottoms of the pieces I can just lay it on the kiln shelf but one of the things I know about watching uh, <coughs> beginning students is they they dip the piece in the wax and be because they're impatient, they want to see what a good job they did, so they tilt it over real fast, and then this drip runs up the side. So then they have to do the same thing I do, which is scrape it. So you have to be patient with wax, and you really have to pay attention. I think that's one thing I like about uh, ceramics, is that you have to pay attention. You can't be daydreaming, and you can't be worried about whatever. You have to be thinking about what you're doing, or you're just going to make mistakes. And I was thinking about hurrying, and that's how come I love the, the wax. Okay, when it's hot like this, the wax doesn't roll, the glaze doesn't roll off the wax perfectly, so sometimes you have to help it along. And so I really kind of like cooler weather better because then I don't spend so much time dabbing. Do you have to take your fingerprints or smudge prints off? Oh, uh, that'll this will be all right. That was that comes from uh, again when you're demonstrating, you're not being as uh, precise as you are when you're working by yourself. So then I would wax this one, dip it, wax it. So so you can see that it's just pretty much the same thing. When you dip it, doesn't it go into the inside of the bowl a little bit? No, because well, it depends. Like if you tilt it okay, gotcha. and then bring it straight down. Also, if you bring it up fast, it'll splash up inside, but if you cap it off carefully and push down carefully, then you won't get glaze on the inside. Oh, I was going to show you about the cones, because part of what makes my, my, this idea work, work is that I'm very careful about the firing process. A lot of potters, when the automatic shutoff falls, well, there's a little flap that cuts off the electricity, um, their, their firing is over, but I fire my electric kiln like reduction cotters, gas kiln cotters fire theirs. They watch these little pyrometric cones in, in a little peep. So you're looking at this cone through a peep. And this firing I must have chickened out. I didn't fire it hot enough, so I would have gotten a lot of straight lines. This one probably went a little too far, maybe just right. It depends on some of the glazes. Some glazes are more fluid than others. But I'm really working towards something like, like this one probably looks perfect. This one went maybe a little too far. I'm looking for the perfect bend. And that's hard to achieve because for one thing it's hard to see. You have to place it really precisely. And it's really red hot in there for another thing. Also, even though it's an electric kiln and it seems like a fairly small enclosed box, the temperature varies a lot. Like the bottom might be at this point when the top is at this point. In fact, that this morning I had a kiln firing where the top was at this point and the bottom, bottom was at this point. So what I do is I turn those sections of the kiln off and then keep the cold section on longer. And this requires that I monitor that part of the firing very carefully. Mm -hmm. And I can't be distracted by phone calls and, and then suddenly realize, oh my God, I have a firing going. That's happened before, believe me. And I've paid dearly for that forgetfulness. I try to, you know, to set timers and have people around me remind me, but once you turn that automatic shut off back on, it doesn't automatically shut off anymore. You have to pay attention to the cones. But in order for me to get the really specific results that I'm looking for, I have to fire it that precisely. Uh, so anyway, I was showing this piece here as the same color sequence as this. This is kind of one of my favorite looks. I don't know why, but I sort of like these deep burgundies running into these um, mauves with a hint of green and a lot of deep blues. So I reproduced that color sequence quite a bit. Now on some of this dinnerware, and I was thinking today about potters that influenced me. This is a, a technique that Sylvia Hyman uses, but hers, she didn't rely on the melting of the colors. They were sort of very separated bands. And this technique I learned from Sue Barnes, who's not a practicing potter anymore, but she used to pour a glaze in the middle, pour it out, and wipe a circle. So that's what I started doing with my dinnerware. And the last color, this is uh, the mystery blue, the pink, that mauve, and then I'm going to do green, and then it'll be burgundy on the rim. 
So when somebody orders a set of dishes, basically the lip color is the rim color, and then it follows the same sequence. It's just on a plate you can't get quite as much melting because it's a flat surface. So there will be some kind of swirling effect and because of where it overlapped the glazes there will be some gradation from one color to the next. But it won't be as runny as the, as the vertical pieces. But, you know, if somebody's ordering a set of dishes from me, you can tell it's a set. But they, have, they match very nicely. Okay, so on this one I'm going to do a pour. I'm going to saturate the clay body so that when I pour it off, I don't have to wipe as much. I'm going to do a pour to get that last color before the rim. Kind of wiggle it around a little bit. Pour it off. Shake it a little bit to get excess glaze on the top of there. And then wipe that rim. And again, I because it's warm, the wax doesn't repel completely, so I have to sort of help it along. You wouldn't want it to have a straight, smooth line. You Pardon me? You wouldn't want it to have a straight line on it. You want it to have... Right. That's that kind of human quality that yeah. handmade pottery needs to have. Otherwise, why would people buy it when they can buy perfect machine-made stuff? for a lot less. Okay, so because I've saturated the rim with water, I won't do this last color until tomorrow. But can anybody guess what I would do next? Before I put the rim color on? Wax. Wax on the rim. Right. Wax the rim. Right, I would wax this green color, then put the burgundy on. How do you get the wax off them? Or they come oh, off? that's a very good question. <laughs> Actually, the wax burns off fairly early in the firing. As soon as the kiln gets to like five, eight hundred degrees, this place fills with smoke. So I have to turn on all the exhaust fans. Basically, I have to clear out of here. And that's why wax, bur wax resist patterns doesn't that doesn't work for every potter because not every potter has a, a studio where they can escape. You know, if you have your studio in the basement of your house, how are you going to get rid of wax and resist burn off? Well, you can build a hood and exhaust it. And uh, some of the commercial kiln companies sell little exhaust systems now, so it's um, easier to use wax and resist now that they have those venting systems. But it is a problem that I have to still deal with. Um, what else? Oh, okay. I got one just around the corner here. Since it uses a lot of texture in her pieces, and she uses different things like the And she's always come up with different kinds of them. Yeah. I like to view platters as paintings, and so I went to Paducah, went to their quilt museum, and got this great book for 20 bucks. And so you can see how it inspired this new series oh, yes. of work. Oh, the colors are very similar, and there's a similar feel to it. And so this is sort of like a painting to me. And it's a lot of steps and it's a lot of colors. And it oh, is crazy. Cool. And these are crazy quilts, by the way. <laughs> crazy quilt patterns. And I feel pretty crazy after I've done one. <laughs> it usually takes about two or three days of involvement before it's done. But I have to do a lot of mask tape, mask, masking tape blocking to get straight lines. Like wax gives you fairly straight lines, but when you put when you apply a glaze, if you tape off that area, then you get a perfectly straight line. So I usually work from the middle out, and I do these two lines first, and then I do all the little squares. So on this one, for example, I would have dabbed the little green colors, waxed those, blocked it off with masking tape, and then poured that area, rather than brush it because Brushing doesn't give good even application. So each area is like that, taped off, or after maybe, some of them are solid, but most of them have some sort of pattern on them. I'm sorry? Yeah. So I just started these um, pieces based on quilt patterns, and it probably won't be a long-lived series. <laughs> some series last longer than others, but if it turns out to be too tedious, I find I just keep putting it off and putting it off. 
So while I'm still excited about this idea, I'll probably do half a dozen to a dozen of them. But once I'm finished with this series, I almost never go back to it. If y'all would like to see Susan's work, she has uh, some work in here if you want to see it. There, there, yeah, there's other platters. I'm doing a Paisley <laughs> series and a, there's a landscape series. And that's that's my art. So. See why I like to wash my favorite potters? Right. Yeah, when you got green coming off purple. Look at the kilns right here. She so melts the wax. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to get away. Ready to be fired, all loaded up.